What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again. And this time we are here with John of the Almighty Scamo. Thank you so much for uh, coming on to the show today. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's a pleasure. It's so awesome to have you here. So just to save myself the embarrassment of trying to pronounce the new name, because I know that it's not pronounced like it looks, uh, but what many fans are going to be calling Yidler, how do you say mm -hmm. it? How do you say it? <laughs> it's Italish. Italish. Yeah. 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 I was close <laughs> as a virtual. Yeah. 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 <laughs> First question I have to ask is I'd imagine you guys are doing a lot of press with the new album. Has anybody gotten it right on the first time pronouncing it? Uh, no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So to, all well, the, to anybody who dislikes this YouTube video just because I uh, mispronounced it, just know everybody is. So. Yeah, uh, we we didn't even think about it because you know the last one was pretty pretty easy, Sorkir. But before that, we had an album called Vakuvisur Iktrasils, and we finally we thought we had topped the the unpronounceable titles. We thought that was relatively easy. This one, but apparently, yeah, I hadn't thought about the yeah. the, the why has a different. It, it, it's so uh, ironic. Sound, so. It's so ironic yeah. because you have a very easy logo to read, which most bands don't <laughs> these days, but you have difficult names to pronounce. So the, the pattern is the harder it is to read the logo, the easier it is to pronounce. The harder it is to pronounce, the easier it is to read the logo. That's the pattern right there. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense, actually. Yeah. I thought about doing a heavy metal Wheel of Fortune where they show like a logo and people have to guess what like letters it is there and everything like that. We've got to make that happen. <laughs> but it's so awesome to have you here because um, with this new record, was this, you know, the last time I had a scout mold on the show, um, we were discussing the live album that you guys put out, the 10 year anniversary live in the Reykjavik. Uh, which was mm -hmm. a fantastic live album. In fact, uh, I went to Reyk I went to Reykjavik for the first time last year and was listening to that uh, on the way there. But uh, was this new album intended to be sort of like a continuation of Sorker, your previous one, or was this meant to be like new uncharted territory for Skalmold? Um, we we really don't think about it that much when we are writing. Um, somehow it always seems that that. Uh, a new album is al always a bit of, I don't know, a bit of a departure from the album before because we've done something and then we probably like uh, not without knowing it, try to do something slightly different. So like, uh, Medvaihtum was really raw. So the Kubis was a bit more polished. Uh, but now, since it, been, it was five years between, um, I don't think we actually got stuck in that. So it's kind of like starting completely afresh. Mm. And and yeah, we no, we were just having fun, yeah. really. We just jammed it a lot. We went together and, and locked ourselves up for a couple of days and just wrote material for like 12 hours a day. And it's just something that happened. It was no plan of doing anything different or new or mm. or even trying to copy something else it's just happened yeah. well you know with scow mold you know meaning uh, age of sword and all this has like there always been because there's been a lot of uh, icelandic bands and you know a lot of them <clears throat> do incorporate you know the sort of uh nordic culture or the even scandinavian culture and the thematics that are in there mm -hmm. as well like i've interviewed I think like four bands from Iceland now that have the sort of like folk, like uh, uh, pagan element in it and all that. So would you say that maybe like with your style, maybe it's evolved, but have you always, has Scamold always kept uh, the themes of each album fairly similar? Like in a way, do you try to keep like a continuing storyline going? Uh, you mean continuing between albums then? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. Uh, we, we always... We kind of stick with with uh, the theme in a way. It, it, all the albums are like concept albums. They all tell a story, uh, and and we use yeah. I mean, we use the, the Norse mythology and and Icelandic folklore and stuff as a as a basically uh, a ground to build a story on. But it's always just basic like Dungeons and Dragons esque fantasy that we kind of weave around the themes. Um, and 
we started with the first album doing that and it helps a lot when you have a grid of a story and then you kind of write the music to fit that grid like oh we need a like a song for a huge battle we need a song that something dramatic is happening so it it it's makes it really easy to build the the grid of the album through the themes mm. but then the real story and the lyrics come basically after that so but so yeah it's we got kind of used to this i guess mm. and and we still do it well you know i ask a lot of uh, bands that bring these sort of uh fantasy elements and these mythological elements because you know there's a famous saying you know we are what we create you know the painter henry matisse said every painting is a self-portrait so has you or any of your bandmates has your own personal lives or your personal experiences ever uh been a source of inspiration for your songwriting because you know between your first album boulder coming out in 2010 a lot has happened since then we all evolve as people so yeah no um no not really these are just these are just fantasies completely so it's probably i mean everything you you experience i, I think it probably has more to do with how we evolve as musicians but uh, like lyrically and and the stories that's always just completely out of the blue yeah um is there maybe like a lot of research that you and your bandmates kind of do into it? Is there like a lot of reading literature or film or visual art? Like, do you almost kind of like look for different stories or different aspects to incorporate? <laughs> it would be very cool if I said yes, but no, not really. Uh, Sniper, our bass player who writes um, all the lyrics, I mean, he has... He has all those stories. I mean, he, he read them as a child. His father read them to him, and and you know it's it stuck in there. But no, he then he just makes stuff up. He's actually a very active uh, role player, and and he basically just uses that. I mean, we sometimes even put up like schematics for for stories that go like, okay, we need a, a like a. A, a chaotic character. We need a, a, a evil character. We need a good character, and it's basically just set up like a role playing adventure. Mm -hmm. So, no, not much of 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 no, no academic fantasy stuff going on. It's just pure fantasy storytelling. Yeah. yeah um, so when it comes to uh, being that all of you have to though bring in your vocals, I know that um, your bassist writes a lot of the lyrics, but. When it comes to your uh, vocal uh, incorporations, uh, do you all mm -hmm. need to be in the same headspace, like emotionally, in a way? Because you all bring vocals to it. Do all of you kind of need to be in the same emotion or be in the same sort of energy when harmonizing and singing together? Um, actually, no. I mean, we've been doing this for for ten years, and and we kind of by now know each other that well and we know how our voices kind of like fit together so um it comes really naturally for us now because uh Gunnar, our keyboard player is actually a professional choir conductor oh wow and yeah and and just from day one we, we had choir practices like which is not a regular thing to do in a metal band but yeah now we kind of just approach it as as like any other choir it's it's yeah it's, it takes a lot of practice but we we, we managed it mm -hmm. after 10 years mm -hmm. we're finally at the place that that it's not really something we have to think about anymore yeah um when it comes to your approach to drumming though um because mm -hmm. you know with the with the rhythmic elements i feel like rhythm is probably one of if not the most important aspect in this uh style of metal in a way so have have you always preferred to have music before you lay down your patterns and lay down your drumming in a way or have you ever had a whole drum pattern that maybe the band could write according to um no not really it's because we we usually we have like riffs uh usually the guitar riffs come first and then i kind of like lay down my some of my idea of what what it should be which is sometimes completely different to the idea that the guy who had the riff 
uh, had in his mind. But then we just like jam it, and and it usually just we usually don't change it that much. If if it just fits, if it feels good, then it just stays like that. And I mean, I have to even today. I I, I still think like, what would Nico McBrain play on that? Uh, and and use that <laughs> if in doubt always have both nico play and then do that but no it's it's and also because the the vocals are very rhythmical so i have to basically leave space uh i know that i have to leave space for the vocals because especially the harsh vocals in icelandic are very very it's more of a percussion element than like a vocal element in a way oh absolutely so yeah no so yeah it's not much pre- I, even there's a song on this album with where i wrote the riffs and it was the first time ever i did that and that was basically i wrote the riffs before the drums mm-hmm. so so yeah no um when it comes to um because people say that like because drums aren't a very melodic driven instrument that it tends to lack emotion which i think is total mm-hmm. bullshit uh, prove yeah. me wrong. Prove me <laughs> wrong, right? You channel a lot of emotional energy into that, right? Yeah, I do. Think I try at least. No, yeah. I mean it's drums are not well, not musical. That's that's. I think the misunderstanding is because it's not notes. Uh, people tend to think it's not musical, but it's the the rhythm, the the dynamics that make the music, especially dynamics, and. And that's a huge part of of how you portray uh, emotions in music is through dynamics. Is it is it like really loud, or or do you like pull it back a bit? And and it's also about the space you leave in. So without rhythm and without percussion, the music is kind of flat. Your drummer sucks. Your band sucks, right? Yeah, so they say. <laughs> <laughs> it's they say it because it's true. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. What is in your arsenal of gear actually? Because uh, I never really got to talk gear with bands that bring like the sort of folk elements into there. Like, are you? Uh, mm-hmm. What is your sort of like your uh, drum gear of choice? Uh, it's very straightforward. I'm I'm a Pearl and Dorsey, and and it's just a very straightforward kit. I actually added. Um, I made them actually myself. Some added concert toms to the kit for this album because I, I wanted like more of these bigger, longer breaks with more toms. Um, otherwise, it's just very standard rock and roll band. I mean, it's three guitar players. We all tune in standard E, no drop tunings. Um, but I think the, well, the thing that sets Skelmet apart from from most other bands is the oboe. Not many heavy metal bands uh, use the oboe, and Gunnar, our keyboard player, is is a phenomenal oboe player as well. Yeah. Uh, although we don't use it live because that would be impossible, <laughs> because it's it's a ridiculous instrument to play. The, the, uh, the front of house sound guy will love you guys if you bring that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. A uh, part of me wonders, like, because uh, when I, you know, as somebody who's seen Heilong and Wardruna and like um, a lot of these folklore bands, I do wonder, mm-hmm. like, how they have to have those presets in the in the mixer to get all those to equally shine. I've seen local bands bring them at like dive bars, and I could just like I see the head, I see the headache crawling up the sound guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's especially if if you're using a lot of of these vintage like if you try to combine like we played with with bands like l of it who are amazing but it must be pretty hard for a sound guy where you have you know bagpipes and you know hurdy-gurdy and and these different elements one is really loud and one is really sensitive to kind of get the the whole thing to to gel no i mean we are just we just basically just a rock and roll band we only have standard rock and roll type of instrument so it's kind of easy yeah well i mean i would say that like you have many different elements between the viking folk metal and the uh 
and the rock and roll. I it, like because I feel yeah. like with a lot of like the Viking and folk metal stuff, you have to approach it very like you know, uh, you have to be very specific. You have to approach it almost like a composer, like like uh, mm-hmm. Hans Zimmer esque in a way. But you guys have a very rock and roll approach to it, so I think that's kind of what makes Skalmold unique in that regard. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think that I mean we we don't have much of a, a folk music tradition in Iceland because uh, during the Middle Ages music was for the most part except for church music just banned so there is no uh, ancient Icelandic folk music except for the vocals except for the the, the fifths the harmonizing fifths so we kind of have to um, like fill in the gaps a bit and I think that that's that's fun actually because we, we have space to do it uh i mean we can put basically whatever and say it might have been like that mm-hmm. and, and it makes it kind of yeah it makes it a lot of fun mm. uh how do you know when you are finished with a song <laughs> <laughs> we usually don't um because when, when we're writing uh the lyrics are usually not ready until basically we start singing so it, it's basically they're still warm from the printer when we are reading them and we are usually doing all the vocal arrangements in the studio so even when we go to the studio with a song that's okay that's finished because we know it has a beginning and the ending and we know what we're going to play we still don't know how it will sound it's like okay we think this is good but we know we have to add all the skullmult elements to it yet the vocals the choirs and so so we really we really don't know when we go into the studio how the song is actually going to sound so like for example now we only had nine days we only gave ourselves nine days in the studio so we had to go in with with all the songs we know all maybe 80 percent how they are going to end up and the rest is basically just a snapshot of the band in the studio doing it kind of in real time. And then you just have to let it go. <laughs> it almost seems like every Skamold album is a live album in that regards. Yeah, in a, in a way. I mean, it's it's we don't spend a lot of time, uh, you know, polishing the songs and the arrangements before the studio. And I, I th- think in a way that probably keeps um, like the excitement in the song to a certain degree uh, because it's 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 now or never it's it's not like yeah we've planned this completely it's it is happening a lot in the just in the moment Definitely. so uh, and I hope it, it yeah and I hope it it it, it shows yeah well if you work on something for a long period of time does it make it more and more like the longer you work on something the harder it is to sort of capture that moment in time yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 sometimes you just you just lose the point in a way i mean you 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 kind of lose where you were going to go with it because it's gone circle after circle after circle and you start trying to fix things that maybe didn't need fixing at all yeah, you know, you end up overcooking it. Yeah, yeah, in a way. So before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today and uh, for such an awesome conversation. Most of all, thank you for an awesome new album. Just uh, thank before you. we go, is there uh, anything else uh, with Scalmo that you would all like to promote in terms of upcoming shows, tours? What can we be expecting for this new album? And you say the album, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... Yeah, basically, I mean, we're releasing our, our new album, our sixth studio album, which is crazy, called Italir on Napalm Records in, in August. Um, we have our first European headline tour in October. Really looking forward to that. And there's some festivals and stuff. Um, I just play the drums, so I'm not quite sure of the schedule. I just show up when I'm supposed to be. Uh, don't they put but, the schedule and everything like on the drum set? Like I figure you of all people would like know it. I've been backstage before. I've seen... I, I know. I mean, but 
I know that they, they, I'm, I'm supposed to be at this place at that date, but you know, take it like half a year ahead, then you, I'm totally lost. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, uh, just try to to keep an eye on us on on social media and stuff, and you'll find out what we're doing. Hell yeah. Well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> we are here with Scamold. Be sure to check out their brand new album. What is it called? Italis. What he said out on Napalm Records very soon. This is Alex <laughs> from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.